Good afternoon and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's digital editor. And I'd like to say a great big thank you for you all for coming along. I know many of us are trapped at home at the moment and hopefully a webinar and event like this is a good opportunity for you to stretch your intellectual muscles and uh, find out about something, a pressing issue in our industry and also ask a few questions, engage with some of the people who really know what's going on. And today we're looking at how regulations shape chemical industry innovation. We've partnered up with Viva Systems for this. They're a global provider of cloud-based software solutions. They help quality, regulatory, and commercial teams in cosmetics, consumer goods, and chemical industries to unify all of their disconnected processes, their documents, and data. Now, they've worked with us to identify an area of interest and to put forward the perfect speaker to help us get a better understanding. So over the course of the next hour, we're going to find out about the top regulatory trends in 2020 that shouldn't be ignored and which consumer drivers are increasing chemical regulation. So we will identify or we'll be able to identify chemical ingredient innovation hotspots. We'll understand the challenges that regulatory affairs professionals in the chemical industry are facing. And we'll understand how digital transformation supports agility, transparency and efficiency in regulatory affairs. And we'll find out why that efficiency is really a key part of the story shortly. So to talk to us about all of this, we have exactly the right person, Andrew Douglas, who is Director of Strategy and Chemical Industry for Viva Systems. He's responsible for the chemical market strategy for Viva Software. He's got more than 20 years experience in R&D and marketing within the chemical, biotech and consumer goods industries. And we'll be hearing more about that shortly. But before I hand over to Andrew, I'd like to tell you a bit about the software and how you can interact with it. So we're using a platform called GoToWebinar, and that will appear as a column on one side of your screen. It's different for everybody and you can arrange that however you like. You should also see the screen that we're sharing, which right now is just a slide explaining who and what we're talking about. The most important bit of that GoToWebinar panel for us is the questions box. So there's a questions box in there that you can use to ask questions to our speaker at any point throughout the webinar itself. So any question occurs to you at any time, drop it in there and we will put it to Andrew when we come to the end of the presentation. So do please get all of your questions in. If we run out of time, then don't worry. What we'll do is we'll pass them all on to Andrew along with your email addresses. And if he's got a good answer for you, and if he has time, he'll be able to get back to you uh, with the sort of thing that you're looking for. So do please get all of your questions in there. There's also a couple of polls coming up. So we'd like to uh, get your engagement and make sure that you're getting as much as you can from the webinar itself. Now, if there's any part of the webinar that you would like to go back to and watch again, uh, we will be making a recording available that will land in your inbox at some point in the next few days. So if there's anything you missed, don't worry, you can go back and watch the whole thing again at your leisure. Now, for that reason, we also don't share the slides from the webinar. So what we will do is we share the recording because what we think is important is not just the slides and the text on the slides, but the words that our speaker, that Andrew is saying. So we won't share the slides. We do share the recording that will be in your inbox shortly. And as a little thank you to everybody who's turned up today in real time to attend the webinar, you'll also get a certificate of attendance for that. That will also show up in the same email that will come in a couple of days time. So I think that's probably quite enough from me now. Do get your questions in as the presentations go through. But the next thing we'll do is we will hand over control to Andrew and he will be able to pick up with his presentation from there. So let's hand over to Andrew now. Andrew, thank you ever so much for joining us. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what you have to say. Well, thank you very much, Ben. And thank you very much to the Royal Society of Chemistry for the opportunity to speak. This is a subject which is quite close to my heart and it's really impacted everything I've worked on pretty much in the chemical industry. And what I would like to talk about is just how regulations are shaping innovation in our chemical industry. So let me first start by talking about first to market and this concept of first mover advantage. And this is a study from McKinsey and Company. And what they found, they studied in this case, the pharmaceutical industry. And what they found is that the first big mover into a market tends to sustain a competitive advantage. First, the market would tend to have about 40% share, the second major company to enter a market, about 33, and then diminishing returns the later you enter market, which really speaks to this importance of speed and advantage to getting there first. And there are a couple of good examples. One example is Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola 
entered the market about 13 years before Pepsi. And even after 100 years, they still maintain a market share advantage. In terms of tablets and smartphones, Apple had first mover advantage and continues to sustain that advantage in terms of market dominance today. Set against this is what's happening in terms of regulations. And what we're finding is that for chemical products, compliance times are growing. So this is working against speed the market. And I've got two graphs here. If you just look on the left-hand side, the first one is product lead time. That's the time a product after identified takes to get to market. And for a pesticide, it was found that that increased by about two years over a period of about 12 years. And the authors indicated that this was principally due to the complexity and volume of data required by the regulatory bodies. And we can really dimensionalize that if we look on the right side of this graph and just look at pesticide registration costs over the same amount of time, which tripled from about $10 million per registration for active to about $30 million, which just speaks to the volume of data and studies that have to be put together to be able to get these chemicals to market. But first, let me just say a little bit about myself and how I get here and how digital fits in with my career. I started my career at the University of Southampton. I did a PhD in chemistry and the subject of liquid crystals and then a couple of postdoctoral fellowships in the USA. I was a bench chemist. It was a world of no books and desktops, really. I mean, desktop computing and word processing was really just coming online. I then moved to Syngenta, an agrochemical company, where I spent time developing formulations, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. And from a digital perspective, this was all about isolated databases. We had a very powerful database, which collected all of the formulation information, all of the specification information, but it was isolated. It wasn't connected to other systems in the enterprise. I then moved to Solvay, a B2B, business to business company, developing specialty chemicals. And we would work with partners like Procter & Gamble. In this example here, we worked on new polymers to make shampoo more effective. We worked on oral care products like toothpaste. After Solvay, I moved to Clorox and then really got introduced to high performance computing, modeling simulation. You can see that bottle there of 409 spray cleaner. And we were using very high power computing to be able to design effectively the perfect bottle, the least amount of plastic, the most amount of strength and design. And also we became introduced to NLP analytics, nat natural language processing. And what we were doing is we would go and take the consumer word around products, all of those reviews on Amazon, and we would ingest those reviews at scale thousands and thousands and thousands, and then analyze all of those words for trends, which would give us insights on how to make products better. I moved into biotech at Zymogen, where I was really opened up to the power of computing and the power of machine learning, where the machines were better able to design genetic experiments than even our best scientists. And then finally, I've moved to Viva in the cloud software space. So let me just say a little bit about Viva. Viva began in 2007, very much focused on life sciences, on the pharmaceutical industry. And what they did was they built software which allowed those pharmaceutical companies to manage end-to-end -end innovation, right? The complexity of trials, clinical trials, being able to develop the products, build huge registration dossiers for agencies, and to be able to manage how those drugs are operating in the marketplace. And what Viva really does is it allows you to put documents, data, workflows, and reports all in one place. So you work from one source of truth. Just to bring this to life, and if we think about our regulatory professional that we're going to talk about today, you know, the regulatory professional today is typically working in disconnected systems and disparate processes. It's like, you know, they have an Excel spreadsheet here, and they send an email there to, uh, to initiate a piece of work, and there's a study in a SharePoint somewhere. And it's a very disconnected, disparate operating model, you know, using outdated materials. And it's very difficult for somebody new who comes into a company to actually onboard. I mean, it's hard enough to figure out how to do your job. Finding out where everything is and how to interact with that just makes it twice as hard. And 
you know, these companies can transform to this idea of a single truth, unified processes, and a, and a system that tells you what to do next, when to do it, and it really tells you how to do it too. So you institutionalize your expertise. That's enough about Viva. Now let's talk about the chemical industry and what's happening. So one of the big things we're seeing is that, you know, profit growth has been stalling for the last one or two years after a pretty good run in the industry. And that, of course, brings with it a big pressure for companies to become more efficient. And one way they drive efficiency is by consolidating to seek efficiencies. And there's a big movement of consolidation in the industry. And I'll just give you one example from this, from this graph here. ChemChina purchased Syngenta for $50 billion. It was a huge transaction. So consolidation is occurring in the industry. Another thing that happens on a very constant basis, and these could be very small, but they could be very large, is the shaping of portfolios in chemical companies, which is just constant and constantly moving. In this case, I show a big one, two of the largest chemical companies in America, Dow and DuPont, who came together, I think in 2016, and they, they mixed their portfolios up and then kind of spun themselves back out as a new Dow, a new DuPont, and a, and a brand new Corteva, which was the combination of the agribusinesses of Dow and DuPont's legacy. And the ink was barely dry on that about a year ago, and now DuPont have now announced they're spinning off their nutrition business and they're merging that with international flavors and fragrances. So another big transaction following right behind it. So shaping of portfolios to get those product lines perfectly fit for industry and for the market, for consumers, is a constant. Another big factor in the chemical industry has been the move to the East, which was ostensibly driven by efficiency, right? And, and what we see today is that China is really becoming the center of gravity for chemicals. And there are some interesting implications of that. And one, which I'd like to bring to life, is on the right-hand side of this. And it's the material BIT, which is a well-known preservative, which is used in many cosmetic products and many industrial products also. And in 2019, what happened was, it turns out that OBIT is made through one intermediate, orthonitrochlorobenzene. And it also transpired that there was only one company in the world, in China, that was manufacturing that. And the government showed, sorry, the government closed that facility down. And suddenly, literally thousands of companies around the world were suddenly without a key preservative for all of their liquid products. And nobody really knew this. And it speaks to the idea of global supply chains that frankly are not yet transparent enough. There's a lot we could say about consumer trends and consumers are really demanding a lot and things like personalization. But I just want to focus in on two, safety and sustainability, because there are two big drivers we're seeing in industry. One is a shift to natural products away from petroleum based products and this idea of waste becoming a defining issue, in particular plastic waste, and what to do with it and how not to you know, poison the environment with it. And what we find with natural products, and I give this example here of deodorants, where the two biggest deodorant players, Unilever and Procter & Gamble, actually went out and acquired natural product companies. It's kind of weird if you think about it. These two have the biggest innovation engines in the entire deodorant industry, yet they're going out to buy these natural products. And these natural products are growing at about twice the rate of their synthetic analogs in categories because consumers are demanding them. Consumers believe they're safer and better for the environment. So consumers are putting pressure on chemical companies. And what happens? Governments respond to that consumer pressure and they respond with the tools that they have which is legislation. And we've seen in the last 20 years some very significant legislative efforts. Uh, the biggest one from Europe is the program REACH, the Registration, Evaluation and Authorization of Chemicals. And since about 2006, there have been more than 20,000 chemical substances registered, supported by about 100,000 dossiers of content of tox data, physical chemical data, which 
cost the industry more than two billion dollars to to put together and we're seeing other countries follow like korea like thailand okay on the consumer side there's a benefit there's a huge public database of safety data across all chemicals it's fabulous from a consumer perspective what we've also seen with the united states environmental protection agency they instituted reform about two to three years ago and, and part of that chemical reform is that we're now seeing an increase in what are called consent orders and snurs and what this means is that effectively when they're submitting these chemicals for registration to the epa the epa is coming back and saying okay you can do it but here are all the restrictions that you'll have to follow so they're no longer getting unrestricted access to market, they're having to track volumes perhaps, they're having to only sell so much before they go and do more tox data, et cetera. And finally, I'd like to speak to an example from the state I live in, from California, from Proposition 65, because it really brings to life how smaller entities can really have global impacts. If you're a manufacturer anywhere in the world and your ingredient pops into a Californian's hands or shelf, then you are regulated by the state of California. And all of the information they have to do to check compliance flows all the way back up the supply chain. Everybody has to be compliant. And I want to take a, a real life example and talk about how chemicals can enter even the same market via different regulatory paths. And the example I want to use today is skincare. These products that a human would apply to their skin. On the left hand side, I have sunscreen active ingredients. On the left hand side, I have what are termed cosmetic actives. Okay, on sunscreens, things like avobenzone, octocrylene, right, very good UV absorbers. And these are regulated in the USA as drugs, the OTC, FDA regulated drug materials. Cosmetic actives are actually regulated as cosmetics. And I have two examples here, peptide three, the peptides became very popular in the early 2000s because they have great effects on skin. And a more recent kind of darling of the natural products, which is sourced from a rare plant in China or in, I think, Chile, is bacuchiol, which is touted as an alternative to retinol for anti-aging. This classification of sunscreen active versus cosmetic active has a dramatic effect on the risk and in investment. Right. If we look at the sunscreen actives on the left hand side, it can take between six and 15 years to get a product registered in the USA. You need to provide a very deep dossier of toxicological, physical, chemical data, etc., to be able to demonstrate that the product can be used. And you have a very high risk of getting into difficulties with registration which could mean delays, it could mean additional costs, but could even mean that you don't get registered at all. So on the other side, for cosmetic actives, very streamlined registration. In fact, you don't have to submit data. What you do have to do is keep on file information to show that you're safe if somebody comes and asks a question later. And you've got very low risk of registration difficulties. With that, we'd like to open up our polls. Thank you very much, Andrew. So hopefully the next thing people will see will be our first poll question. So how many new UV filters, so these are the sunscreen actives, the sorts of compounds that were on the left of that last slide, how many were approved by the US FDA in 2018? And there's a reasonable good range there. You know, is it just is it just a handful, one to 10? Do you think it's in, in the, the high tens or maybe even as many as 100, a few hundred or Really quite a few, yeah, 500 plus. What are we looking for? So what do you all think? Let's uh, let's give you plenty of chance to, to vote and get those in. And you can have a think about the sorts of compounds that might be used in sunscreens, the sorts of claims that you're entitled to make when the sunscreen uh, compound is approved, and how many do you think got through in 2018? That's a whole year. Now, uh, about 65% of people have voted now, I think. So let's close down this poll and quickly share the results so we can see the sorts of things that people think. So uh, it's a relatively even spread, actually, very slightly edged 
into the sort of one to a hundred bracket there. Most people think one to 10, uh, an almost equal number thinking 11 to 100. Virtually nobody thinks that, uh, that it was 500 plus and 10% of our audience think that not one single sunscreen active was approved. I'm actually gonna follow this up immediately with a second poll. So let's run the second poll as well. So that was the sunscreen actives. The next part is uh, what's, what's currently on the right-hand side. So these are new cosmetic ingredients. So again, think about the sorts of claims you can make that this will make you look 10 years younger. It'll take years off you, reduce lines and bags and signs of age. How many of those ingredients do we think got new designations in 2018? So the same year. And we're looking at the same sorts of numbers as well. So again, we're gonna give you all plenty of chance to vote. What do you think? What do you think? Uh, uh, how many do you think managed to get through in one year's time? And again, think of all those wonderful claims about how it'll make you look so much more younger, so much more attractive. These are bold claims we're making about a, a set of compounds. Um, I think most of you have voted now, so we'll close that one. And uh, we'll, once again, we'll share the results. Slightly different distribution this time. Uh, we've got more people confident that uh, more than 500 made it. Uh, still in that sort of 11 to 100, you know, high tens, 34% uh, of you. Few more think that it might have been edging towards the, the high hundreds, so 100 to 500 there. And again, nobody thinks that not one single compound got through. Andrew, how does this square up with uh, with your own expectations? What would you have thought if you didn't have all the knowledge you have now? What would you expect? I would certainly have expected that some sunscreen actives would become registered. And I would expect a reasonable number of cosmetic ingredients becoming registered. I don't think I would expect what the real answer is. <laughs> You only have to uh, flick through a magazine or watch television for a, a, an hour and you'll see lots of adverts, all sorts of new new fancy science sounding compounds that help you look younger. So let's let's close the poll results now. So I think uh, we now need slide. to see the real answers and I'll hand back to you, Andrew. Yep, so let's go to the, this slide. And, and so in fact, the answer is in terms of sunscreen actives, there were no new registrations in 2018. And in terms of cosmetic ingredients, which were being given inky names, it was about a thousand. So the difference in distinction is huge. For sunscreens, pretty much since 2005, the US FDA has not moved at all. In fact, in 2015, there was legislation put in place by Congress to force the FDA to actually come back and tell companies whether or not they were approved with the compounds that had been sitting at the agency. And the FDA promptly just then rejected everything and said, we need more data, which put an impasse in the industry. On the cosmetic ingredient side, we're seeing a huge number of new ingredients coming to market. And in particular, around the natural space, right? Natural extracts or biotechnology products generated by microbes. And you can start to understand this when you can see what kind of investment in return you get, right? A sunscreen can cost you millions to register. And if you're lucky, you'll sell it for $100 per kilo to a consumer goods company, right? A cosmetic ingredient can sell literally for up to thousands of dollars per kilo, right? With very minimal registration costs. So from a US market perspective, it totally makes sense to go cosmetic ingredient route and not work on sunscreen actives. Next slide. So we can map this out and start to build a picture of where innovation is occurring in the chemical industry based on a consideration of the value of that chemical in the market and the investment which is required to bring it to market, in particular the regulatory investment. And if I just take you to the top right hand side of this diagram, you see pharmaceuticals and pesticides where the, the returns are very high and therefore the investment is there. And what do we see right now with COVID-19? I think there are more than 230 clinical trials running right now to try and find new therapies to address COVID. It's a very active innovation spot, right? If you move to the left-hand side of that diagram, you have a very different story. And if you think about actives for oral care or actives for sunscreen or biocides, there's almost no innovation work going on in this space. Despite, I would argue, very pressing consumer needs. If you take oral care, more than 50% of people have cavities. And in fact, the 
it's generally worsening. And part of this is being driven by the Western diet, which is moving towards these sticky carbohydrate-based foods, which tend to stick to the teeth and generate more acid and increase erosion of the teeth. Sunscreen, which we just talked about. In the USA, there are more than 1 million diagnoses of skin cancer and more than 15,000 deaths per year, which are preventable from radiation effects. And biocides, if you just juxtapose that against pharmaceuticals, we just talked about how many clinical trials are running to find solutions for COVID. On the biocide side, there are a couple of frontline chemistries. One of them is sodium hypochlorite, bleach, right? Clorox, the company I work for, sold its first bottle of bleach in 1913. The other major chemistry that's being used are quaternary ammonium salts, chemistries which again are more than 50 years old. And there is no talk or discourse about the generation of new biocides or things that are coming to market to help be able to, to solve for contact exposure. You can also look in the lightly regulated area and you can find some very valuable spaces to play in. Supplements, cosmetic actives, electronic materials in particular, very good return on investment, right? How can you find a material to get on the six billion screens which are in our homes and workplaces? Let's go to the next slide. So now I wanna just switch gears a little bit and start to talk about the, the life of the regulatory professional inside the chemical industry. And I just wanna take two examples, specialty chemicals and crop sciences. And the companies I'll just use to highlight are Solvay and Syngenta, not because they're special, I, I worked there, so I know a little bit about them. They are actually similar sized companies, revenue around 10 to 12 billion, right? But, in terms of the number of products that they sell into the marketplaces, Solvay has more than 10,000 different products that they actually sell across their customer base. Syngenta has an order of the hundreds of products, very different dimension in the number of products that they sell. And, and Solvay's products mostly are lightly regulated or lighter in terms of regulation. And crop sciences, those chemicals are very heavily regulated. Every single active ingredient, every single formula has to be registered actively everywhere in the world. Next slide. The regulatory teams face somewhat similar but distinct challenges in these industries. So a regulatory team in a crop sciences company is very, very much struggles with portfolio management. They might be working on about a thousand concurrent submissions of new dossiers to agencies or renewals of registrations which are coming close to expiration. And of course, every one of those registrations and submissions ties to the ability to generate revenue from a product. And so being able to track and be agile with that portfolio as you're working across global markets is critical and it's not a trivial problem to solve. Equally, they want to globally coordinate all of those submissions and registrations, yet act locally, right? Because you make your submissions and registrations at a local level. So how can you coordinate around the world, yet act in local areas? And lastly, they have an enormous amount of communication going on with agencies, and how can they efficiently, effectively, and most importantly, consistently message back to agencies about their products. That is an enormous challenge for those regulatory departments. <clears throat> On the specialty chemical size, it's a slightly different story. They are supporting thousands of customers with more than 10,000 products, right? Across a whole range of industries from electronics to cleaning products, to drug products, to consumer goods. And the amount of information they need to pass down that supply chain is huge. And so they have a challenge and how can I how can I communicate all of the attributes that are required from a regulatory perspective to my downstream clients? And associated with that, they then have a struggle. How do I find the data and documents which support fact-based compliance communications to those customers? And finally, 
especially chemical companies, are also regulated, as we saw, with initiatives like REACH. And so they also have a global to local challenge in submission management. Next slide. So recently we conducted a study of regulatory professionals. There were about 180 people in this study and very interesting findings. What we find is that more than 50% are really using outdated tools to manage this very complex work. They're using tools that are basically borrowed from the enterprise, nothing specially designed for themselves. They're using Word and Excel and emails to drive workflows and local SharePoints. At the same time, more than 50% of them report they don't have enough resources to get the work done. And most importantly, more than 50% of them fear making costly mistakes, right? If you make a compliance error, this could have enormous implications. We spoke to one company recently, <clears throat> which talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, a more than $1 million consequence of a regulatory mistake. So look at that, you're using tools that are 20, 30 years old, you're short on resources, and your exposure is potentially very high. It's not a great place to be in. You have to have a little bit of, you know, a little bit of empathy for these regulatory professionals. Next slide. But what I would say is that help is at hand and transformation of the chemical industry has begun. We know from the surveys and we know from speaking to all of our clients what they seek, right? They want this real-time dashboarding. They want real-time alerts and workflows that guide them through the processes. And they want all of their information in one place that is easy to get to, easy to navigate, easy to find, and it just simplifies their work. And there are companies which are on the cutting edge of digital transformation for regulatory that have already implemented systems. Like this example we have here from, from Shana, it's Syngenta. And they talked about you know, tasks collapsing literally from weeks to seconds as they implemented an entire regulatory transformation at their company. And next slide. And so I want to take you back to the beginning, right? What did we say? First to market generally wins. First mover advantage is a huge advantage. And you know what? Regulatory teams are playing an ever more critical role in that path and time to market. Next slide. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Andrew. It's a, a fascinating topic and we've had a handful of very good questions in. Um, just one, if we can go back to your sun care example, uh, if there was no products that got through in, in 2018, uh, I assume that's probably a, a trend as well. You, you showed how the return on investment is so low that it's probably not something that many companies are willing to invest in. Now that means that we're relying on skincare products that are now getting quite old. We've seen recently a few uh, different compounds that were used in Sunbox have been banned because of their impact on the environment, for example, which presumably means our pool of chemicals that we can use to protect people against sunburn and skin cancer is actually starting to dwindle. What can we do to to unlock that innovation, to, to encourage more people to invest and create the new compounds that are environmentally benign, but still help to protect people? So it's a very good question. And, um, and it's a real conundrum. You know, the, the FDA's position is that this is a drug that you can put on anybody's skin in unlimited amounts. Like, why should I take a risk, right? I want to see all the data I can think of to make sure that this thing is safe. The chemical companies and the big consumer goods companies who really play in this space all say, hey, I need two things. I need to be able to show technical data. So I've got strong conviction that these materials are better than what's in the market today. And I also need conviction that I can navigate the agency without getting stuck. And that second part is absolutely missing today, which is why nobody's moving. My my sense is that somebody will innovate and disrupt this category and a big part of that disruption will be a, a very fresh approach 
to the regulatory and compliance aspects. Somebody will find out a smart solution that has a different regulatory path. And so once somebody does something like that, or once a new area opens up where return on investment looks potentially good, clearly it will be the people who are very good at getting through all of those regulatory roadblocks who are first to market and as you've shown very neatly twice being first to market is so really important uh, have you got any good examples of where getting to market first was a result of regulatory competence rather than just you know having invented it before anybody else thought of it yeah the, there was an example when i worked at solve where we had discovered um, in, in Australia, a chemical that was very, very interesting and really outperformed the rest of the market. But when we looked at the US regulations, um, it looked like it wasn't approved. And we were like, okay, so we, we can't move on it. We're going to have to start building a submission to get this thing approved to use in the US. But our, our regulatory manager at the time found a very creative way to make that chemistry fit an existing designation and in fact she wrote to the epa and said hey i think it's this and they wrote back and said hey we agree and so actually we immediately unlocked the market and moved and that became the most successful product that our business had over about a period of about five years and it was all because of the insight of a regulatory professional being able to be very creative in the regulations even our competitors didn't know how we managed it very good. Obviously, we won't ask for uh, you know commercial industry secrets there, but I, I guess that's the sort of thing. Looking for new ways, smart ways, and it's a lot easier to do that when you've got all of your data at your fingertips. You know you've got the most recent version of, of everything that's available to you. Uh, let's dive into some uh, audience questions here. So uh, once again, that questions box is in the go to webinar panel. If you want to put any questions in to Andrew, do so now. We've still got plenty of time, so hopefully we'll be able to get through quite a few. Uh, Chris Howick has made a, a comment and a question. He said uh, he wanted to emphasize the point that despite uh, hypochlorite, your bleach example of the biocide earlier, it's uh, over 100 years old. It still requires significant investment to produce an EU biocides dossier. And of course, getting it registered with REACH, it, it is a very potentially harmful compound. So you do need to be aware of the risk assessments involved with handling, transporting and using any biocide. He's saying the current dossier took 10 years to clear and product dossiers are likely to still take three to four years. Do you have any suggestions, Andrew, on, on how to speed this up other than simply employing more regulators so they can get through more of these quickly? Yeah, I mean, it's an it's enormous problem. My understanding is that in Europe, under the BPR, as they call it, there's only been one new registration since 2012. And so there is there is very little activity. And even that registration, I think, was an associated chemical. Um, <clears throat> and as as Chris says, it's an enormous dossier and an enormous investment. Um, I mean, from what I see in the industry, I don't see the companies, you know, I, I worked at Clorox, right? And we, you know, the, the investment in bringing a new material to market was just way too high. Um, and, and so everybody's kind of anxious to move on it. And I'm not sure what will break that down because the, the public has a right to use safe chemistry, that's for sure. But the, my own gut is there should be a, there should be a middle ground, perhaps, um, that can that can help us work. Right? It's probably too easy to get a cosmetic into market or a normal ingredient, and it's probably too hard to get some of these, you know, biocides into market. And then how can you react quickly when you need new chemistries to to deal with emerging pathogens which you hadn't thought about before? Thank you very much. We've had quite a few questions about the the drivers of regulation. So uh, let me see if I can try and uh, summarize a couple of these. Um, okay, this is this is a, uh, probably a little bit sort of the step before you really start to get into regulation. But uh, Sandy Tripathi has uh, said, "What's your perspective in terms of getting into new industries when you can see that there is a groundswell of public support?" that may then lead to regulation. Now, the, the example he's given is the plastics recycling industry. We know that there is currently a big push in public for uh, 
better reuse of our plastics to re in, improve our plastic life cycle analysis and so on. So is this a good approach for industries to be looking at that, predicting what regulations may then come or may be removed, and then use that to start getting into new industries or looking at new chemistries? I think that is just my, my own perspective may not be right, but what we see happening right now, right, is you're seeing the biggest companies in the world, like the L'Oreal's and the Unilever's coming out and making very hard commitments, right, for 2025, for example, on, on plastic use. And it's not altogether clear that they actually have the solutions in place today to be able to manage that, but they've already made the commitment. And so you can see how that's driving efforts all the way down through the industry. And so my sense is that, you know, that the most, usually the, the most pressure the consumers can bear is on, on the choice of what they buy, right? And that's what makes it, that's what makes companies move like Unilever and Procter. Um, and so you see that pressure coming to bear now. And so, I, and I think you also see a lot more research going on on plastic, you know, plastic degradation through microbial processes and other processes. So I'm actually hopeful in this regard. I think the plastic thing will get solved because I think there's enough efforts going against it now and there's enough, you know, there's promises coming to consumers now. And if you think about animal testing, right, there is no ban in cosmetics for animal testing. It's actually a self, the industry did it themselves to make sure that they kept the confidence of consumers. So, uh, so it's definitely a good horizon scanning activity for any chemical company to do to keep an eye on public opinion because ultimately you'll get hit in the wallet uh, so in terms again of, of those drivers of regulation uh, malcolm sansom asks could you register a new and he's put this in air quotes a, a uv protecting compound but register it as a cosmetic compound and therefore sort of sidestep the registration process that that feels a little um feels a, actually... a, a touch unethical no, it's actually a really, really good question, um, and it, it's interesting, and, and I think this is the way it goes. In fact, you can find cosmetics today, right, and they've got things like green tea catechins and such like in them, right, a lot of polyphenols. Those are all UV absorbers. So, in fact, there are UV absorbing chemicals in some cosmetic products today, which are not labeled as such. Now, the position that the companies take, the big players in the market, is that you can put something that's UV absorbing in your product as long as it doesn't contribute to the UV absorbance claim of the product. So I hope that made sense. So essentially, if you put a chemical in there and then you claim sunscreen, you can only put it in at a level below which it's actually effective because as soon as it has UV performance that the agency can see, it then has to be registered by the agency. Long story short, no big company will do, will take on that suggestion because they'll expect to get a compliance action from FDA. So I guess part of that is about the claims that you can make about your product, yes. not, not necessarily about what you believe your product can do, but the, the claims in public that you can. Uh, Rosa Santacana uh, said a similar similar question really, but more about the, the actual reason for the difference. So she, she said, uh, cosmetics, just like sunscreen products are applied to the skin. So why is there such an important difference on the documentation required for these two different types of products? Yeah, you might've got me there. I mean, <laughs> Clearly a historical reason for it. I mean, certainly what happened in the cosmetic industry is that, um, you know, they, in the US, right, they, they came to an agreement to self-manage. And because they've had very few safety incidents, frankly, the FDA hasn't had to come and do anything, right? Most regulation is driven by big events and there haven't been big cosmetic events to drive regulation. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you look at, you know, most chemical regulation, right, came out of things like Bhopal in the 70s and 80s, most mm -hmm. safety regulations. So, and I, I don't actually have the history of where sunscreen, how sunscreen laws came into place, but now they're there, it's, it's hard to see a way past. And I think the expectation is that all cosmetic ingredients will move to more drug-like regulation over time. I think that's everyone's expectation. 
you mentioned earlier as well that it, it can take up to 12 years for a, a sunscreen product to be approved as well as at the same time saying that over the course of 12 years the amount of time it takes has increased by about two years so how quickly do regulations change and if you're not efficient with your processes do you end up in in a situation where you actually need to start the whole registration process again because the regulations have been updated in the time that you've been applying well i think you know for that 10 to 12 years that we talked about that was about pesticide industry that included ah. data collection right so it's not time at agency necessarily it could take you three years to run all your studies or five years to run your studies to be in position to be able to make the submission um for the sunscreen industry the the, the lead times are so long because of you know lack of action not lack of action but you know fda scrutiny um i think it is i don't have specific cases where you know people have made a submission and then the laws have changed around them um i think you know countries like the us typically have a grandfathering rule right you're assessed by the regulation upon which at the time you registered so hopefully there aren't too many people getting caught in, in Groundhog Day of regulations there. Um, a question from Friedrich Cole, who, uh, and I, I think this is, this is playing directly into your hands, but he said, uh, I think what he's looking for is a, a good example, but how do, does your software solution come into play when making your regulatory approval more efficient? So, you know, like a, a dossier, like a REACH dossier, might have you know 30 plus sections right and it's it's really a project to know exactly all of the studies that you have to collect right and all the data you have to collect and, and what the software does is it essentially builds you a template and it tells you exactly which dossiers you have you can assign that work out and then you can track how much of that work is complete and you can flow it all through workflows and approvals and then the software actually will tie your whole package together for you electronically so it's ready to ship out so you can imagine that you know when you walk in day one you don't think oh how did i do that last time it's you know it's all laid out for you and it's like okay this 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 person this person this person and then you track track and complete and then you have a complete digital record of everything that you've done and you can reuse documents across every submission in the world easily. So it simplifies work. So it also deals with that uh, the perennial issue of when somebody moves on to a new industry, you still have all of the track there. You can see what was done. You can see how we approached things last time, what worked, what didn't work. And therefore, you can prevent yourself from repeating mistakes of, of the people that preceded you in the role. And therefore, everybody in the company together will evolve and get better and get more efficient and make fewer mistakes. Exactly. And then, you know, you're, you're tracking every action. So you're building data to tell you where your bottlenecks are. So you can de-bottleneck and accelerate processes. So if you work for a, a small, to medium, you know, an SMA, small to medium price enterprise, uh, and you're using Microsoft Word, using Excel to hold your data, you're just emailing spreadsheets back and forth in order to do all of this and you are a small team how do you know when the time is right to move to a, a cloud solution like this that will do all of that tracking for you I, I think cloud is one of the major revolutions in the digital industry that has occurred and you know we all do our email on the cloud right we do most things today on the cloud it's it's an inevitability so i think the time is now to use you know cloud-based solutions and the advantage of them is that the, the software grows with you. It's a little bit like, you know, people who buy Teslas, right? Teslas are appreciating assets because they're being upgraded while you drive them through digital downloads. It's the same process with cloud software. Whereas, you know, you buy a normal car, you drive it off the lot and it's already depreciating. You're thinking like, how am I gonna sell this thing later? Speaking of cars as well, there's, uh... I guess uh, another question that I have really, how can we learn from other industries? So the automotive industry is, is regulated up to the hilt uh, and they presumably are, are having to put in similar processes, similar thought processes as to how to make sure they're working within the regulations. Again, they're first to market or very close to first to market. So are there lessons that we can learn from sort of parallel industries? 
Yeah, you know, every industry kind of has its, you know, bellwether, if you like, right? If you work in the cosmetic industry, you watch the food industry because typically food ingredient trends flow five to tens later through cosmetics. And then those trends actually then flow through home cleaning products a few years after that. So everyone has someone they look to. I think for the chemical industry, we're all looking to the pharmaceutical industry. That's where it's all headed. And if you look at the pesticide industry, it's almost identical. It's already almost the same as drug industry in terms of the way everything is managed, data control, etc. And I think, you know, with regulations like REACH and such like, you're just seeing a slow progression towards more drug-like checks. Uh, Lizavita Gatina has asked uh, if you could comment more about, about drugs and drug regulation and so on. And in particular, looking at the sort of novel situations that you have for things like generic drugs and orphan drugs as well, which is a special designation given to a drug that would normally uh, not be profitable because it can only treat a, a fairly small pool of people, drugs for things like Ebola. And in fact, some of the, the COVID-19 drugs that we're looking at now were given that designation. Do these sorts of regulatory changes then help to drive investment in pharma? Yeah, they clearly do. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in pharma, but, but you know, like the orphan drug rule, right, which allows you, I think if a drug has a certain number of, if the population which it could treat is a small section of population, then it can get expedited regulation and it gets an easier path through agencies, which means that the investment is lower to make it possible to come to market. I mean, those things make a lot of sense. And if anything, there's probably just more of it that is needed. And it's all about, I think, making judicious risk-based decisions founded on facts. Uh, speaking of facts, and of course, as, as new facts come to light, Christopher Page said that under REACH regulations, we switched away from chromates, and then we got impacted by non phenol and BPA issues, which took, took a little while to come to light, which then sort of means we've gone back to the start. How do we get out of that cycle? Um, well, that is a good question. I don't know. I mean, you see this, right? There tend to be overreactions. Um, Right. And I think there's a probably an anticipation that there's some overreactions even with the COVID stuff today. And a lot of people talk about, right, the the analogies of potential risks, you know, compared to AZT, which came in, you know, for for AIDS and was, you know, really rushed through as a therapy and turned out not to be a good one. So there are just huge dangers and overreaction. Um, I don't know if I have a specific answer. Maybe we can come back to that one later or, or offline. But uh, okay, thank you for your question, Christopher. We'll make sure we we send that on to Andrew. And so if if he can add anything to that, I'm sure he'd be happy to do so. We're starting to run out of time now. Let's pick out a couple more questions uh, from the audience. Uh, okay, this one from uh, Abhigash Sharma, who said, uh, once getting once you've got regulatory approval, uh, what sort of latitude do you have to advance or change a product, or are you then locked into exactly what you got approval for? So it depends on the marketplace you're working in, right? If it's a, you know, like let's take Tosca, right? The inventory, there's about 70,000 listings of chemicals which go into cleaning products, electronics, etc. cetera, right? Um, you know, once that cast number and general description is accepted by the agency, you just have to comply with that. Um, so you've got a fair amount of latitude. And there's, that's why there's so much innovation that's ripe also in polymers, because if you meet basic designations, there's a lot you can do to change the properties and performance of a polymer without hitting any regulatory barriers. And most of the innovation done by specialty chemical companies, and I'm, and I'm not diminishing it because it's very, very creative, is how to operate within current approved chemistry and be able to be very creative within chemistry that already exists so you can reduce your regulatory barriers. That uh, hopefully that will answer uh, a bit of question. Um, we, so we really are starting to run out of time, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to talk uh, a bit more. You, we've on the screen at the moment, we've got the link to uh, industries.viva.com slash chemical where there are some resources, but could you take us through what sorts of resources you have available for people who are considering moving on to cloud type platforms and maybe just getting those first few steps? 
what resources are there out there to help people make that decision and make the most of it? Yeah, I think some of the best things that are on these sites that are on our site are, are the case studies of real examples of customers have actually implemented and then come back and say how it's changed their operating model, how it's changed their business. You know, we we had one customer, for example, talk about, you know, it it, it created a culture of sharing which didn't exist before, right? And so speaking to those deeper benefits that maybe people don't think about, it's not just a piece of software, it's, a, it's how your whole organization works. So case studies, um, clarity of benefits, you know, you can watch demos, you can get a feel for what it really looks like, um, all kinds of resources. Well, I know that you've done a great deal of webinars just in the last couple of weeks, but that sounds like a, an excellent opportunity for a future Chemistry World webinar. If you'd like to come back with a case study, show us some product demos, and I'm sure the audience that we've had today and those who are going to watch the video would be very keen. And with that in mind, uh, just a couple of minutes ago, so I'd like to say a huge thank you to Viva Systems, who uh, put us in touch with Andrew, identified this as a topic, and clearly the, the hundreds of you who have registered agree that this is an interesting topic and very key to a lot of your work. Uh, and I'd like to say a big thank you to Andrew, who's Director of Strategy for Chemical Industry at Viva Systems. Now, we will be sending a recorded version of this out to absolutely everybody who registered. Keep an eye out in your inbox for that. That should be with you in the next couple of days. And if you wouldn't mind, we have an exit survey on your way out. We're always looking for ways to make our webinars as engaging as possible to make sure that we're answering the questions that you want, and also to make sure that the webinar delivers what you expect it to deliver. So please do complete the exit survey on your way out. And if you have any other questions or comments for Chemistry World, then please drop an email to uh, cwwebinars at rsc.org and we'll pick it up there. Any other things you'd like to hear about, uh, if you'd uh, like to, uh, to see a product demo, for example, or hear some more case studies of Viva's uh, software, then please let us know. We'll put that through to Viva and hopefully we'll be able to arrange something. Uh, but as usual, chemistryworld.com is where you can find all of Chemistry World's content. Chemistryworld.com slash webinars is where you can find a list of our upcoming webinars. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's digital editor. I'd like to say one more huge thank you to Viva and to Andrew Douglas. And thank you to you all for attending. We'll see you in the next Chemistry World webinar.